On Blues Radio International, we now take you to Boston, Massachusetts for our friend John Tilley. John is the chair and distinguished professor of the Department of Biology at Northeastern University and also a great fan of blues music. How are you today, John? I'm doing great, Jesse. Fantastic. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm doing great, and there's a lot that I know our audience would like to know about a number of things that you're an expert on. Uh, The first is looking at this from a biological point of view and taking into account that many of us, like me, never went beyond high school biology. What should we make of COVID? Wow, that's a, that's a broad question and difficult one to actually answer. So I'm not an expert on viruses nor COVID, but we certainly know some about it. Um, we've been working on this virus now um, and it's sort of genetic makeup for the past several months. We actually reconfigured my lab uh, in collaboration with a few other folks to try to get a better understanding of what this virus is, um, why is it so devastating when people can get it, um, and why it doesn't actually affect other people. They have the virus and show no symptoms. Um, so it's quite unlike most of the viruses I think we've encountered in the past because it's brand new. We really know nothing about the history of this virus, what it can do, or how long it's going to be around. And we, we have coronaviruses traveling around us every day, and we, well, we get them, and we get colds, and nothing happens. Why is this coronavirus so different? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. You know, coronaviruses, people hear the word, and they think it's specific to this virus that causes COVID-19. So COVID-19 is the disease and all the problems the virus causes. The virus itself is, cause, is called SARS-CoV-2, and it stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, COV number two. Um, it's very similar to SARS, if you remember the SARS breakout from years ago. Um, this is a related coronavirus. Um, coronaviruses are not restricted to these types of um, uh, infections. Cold viruses, as you mentioned, are coronaviruses. Flu virus is coronavirus. Um, and these represent ways that we can actually think about how to manage this virus, um, I think, moving forward in the best possible way. You know, there is no cure for the common cold. How long have you heard that? I heard it from my parents when I was growing up. Um, sometimes these viruses just elude our ability to try to manage them and cure them. Um, Same with the flu. We go through episodes of seasonal flu and we try our best to figure out what flu bug is out there this particular season and prepare a vaccine against that particular strain, so to speak. Um, But it's not always effective. Some people still get the flu even if they're vaccinated. Some people, even if they're exposed, don't pick it up. This virus is far more complicated. Initially, I think when people thought about this virus and the problems it was causing and before it really spread into the United States, I heard a lot of people saying it's just like the the seasonal flu. It'll come here and it'll go away by the summer, just like, you know, all the cold and flu bugs do. And this virus certainly has not gone away. Um, Another big difference, I think, with this particular virus is it's not restricted to, you know, respiratory distress or coughing and, and lung problems, although that certainly is a very concerning aspect of what it can do to people. And that was the big concern earlier this spring when hospitals were running out of bed space for ventilators and so forth, because people really had difficulty breathing. But the more that we understand about this virus, the more that we learn from people who have been infected by it, the more that we track it around the world, uh, we're seeing sort of this uh, diverse spectrum, this plethora of outcomes that people can show, and they may not even develop the respiratory part of this, but they may have uh, problems in their heart, they may have problems in their brains, they may have problems in their circulation. Uh, There's this kind of interesting phenomenon that's come up called COVID toes, in which you see disruptions of blood supply to the toes and perhaps even the fingers. So this virus um, is not a straightforward sort of respiratory distress virus that we're used to dealing with, the cold, the flu. Um, It really can target a lot of tissues in the body. And I think even more concerning is the fact that we're now seeing indications that it could cause longer term harm to those tissues once they're damaged. One of the most exciting things in this terrible, tragic situation we're in is to see how the brilliant minds around the world have coalesced on addressing it, uh, even though it was something that no one knew was coming, no one could have prepared for and you underwent a major transformation in your research overnight. Can you tell us a bit about that? 
Sure. Yeah, it's a great point, Jesse. I mean, as terrible as this thing is, it really united the world in an effort, um, a unified effort to try to bring together some type of management uh, structure to it, some type of vaccine development strategy, some type of treatment protocols for people who are just getting hit with this right and left. Um, I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime in terms of the uh, ability of uh, something like this to bring people together around the world, break down barriers across countries, ac across everything, just so people could, you know, combine their expertise and come up with a path. Um, the vaccines, I believe there's 170, 170 vaccines currently in development. I, that's amazing to think about that we have that many vaccines uh, under development in various levels of testing. Um, and I think that really exemplifies how serious this is, um, how many people have really committed to figuring out a way to, to help us through this, this pandemic. Um, in my own experience in our lab, uh, we actually do not study viruses. My lab is a kind of a stem cell biology, regenerative medicine biology, fertility uh, type research lab. We've been doing this for many, many years, but we do study genetics. Um, so I teamed up with a few folks at Northeastern and we combined our strengths um, and we essentially rewrote the landscape of our laboratory's work to get a better understanding of one of the key aspects of the virus and that's whether or not a effective vaccine can actually be that will work long term or provide long term protection. Um, I think, you know, one of the the unknowns that we're dealing with right now is since this virus is so new, we have no history on it. We don't really understand how quickly it mutates, so to speak. So like all other things that has genetic material inside of it, that's what replicates in our cells when it infects our cells. And that genetic material can be um, subjected to mutations. Um, those are changes in the DNA sequencing code that the virus has. Uh, those mutations um, sometimes are silent. They don't really cause a change in the virus per se. Other mutations can change um, a characteristic feature of the virus, um, and that can make vaccine development challenging. In fact, that's one of the reasons why we don't have cures for the common cold, because the viruses mutate. Uh, since we did so much with genetic uh, analyses and sequencing long molecules of DNA, um, this virus uh, is about 28,000 uh, bases long. Um, we can take a different stab at this. So our goal wasn't to develop a vaccine, um, look at how it entered cells, try to understand mechanistically if there are treatments that could prevent it from infecting people. Our goal was to understand quickly uh, how rapidly this virus could mutate both across populations around the globe, and I think more importantly within populations um, in a single country. Um, it's a, it's a, a term that um, has been thrown out there recently um, called quasi-species, not to get too scientific, but quasi-species, uh, the way to look at this is that not every single virus particle that we have inside of our body is an identical clone or the same exact thing. Each one's slightly different. Some may mutate in ways that make them more pathogenic or make them more susceptible for transmission to others, more infective. Um, and the problem with a virus like this, as it proceeds through the population, uh, as it expands, it acquires more and more mutations. And what we need to figure out is if those mutations are making it unstable, um, unable to develop a, a vaccine that will give us long-term protection. So the target, in fact, may be moving, even as we're working on 170 different vaccines. Absolutely. And I think that's the take-home message that as optimistic as we are, we will have uh, options for a vaccine at some point in the not-too-distant future. Um, some are in trials right now, and some look relatively promising, at least short term. Um, there's no guarantees with this because if the virus persists and it mutates, it may actually escape what the vaccine is intended to do. Um, vaccines are really an interesting approach to handling a disease because what they do is train your immune system to recognize that foreign substance. So in this case, a vaccine is training your immune system to recognize this virus. It doesn't recognize the whole virus. It will recognize a part of it. And if that part somehow gets altered by a mutation that then changes the uh, appearance of the virus, the vaccine training of your immune system is no longer effective and you could become reinfected. Um, and there's already some evidence that um, even if you've been infected once, uh, there's a possibility that you can become reinfected again. 
There was a study that was just published out of Italy not too long ago, and they found uh, in the Italian population where SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 was fairly prevalent, uh, that roughly 60%, 60% of the people who were infected and recovered actually developed what's so-called antibodies against the virus. That is the immune protective uh, event that keeps you from getting infected again. The scary part of this story is that 40% of the people who became infected and recovered didn't develop those antibodies, suggesting in fact they could become infected again. So we already have some indication without even vaccine trials, this virus is gonna be fairly tricky to manage. So this also gives us a new uh, view of what antibody testing is and what it's worth in trying to assess going forward, doesn't it? Yes, that's true. I, you know, there's a lot of confusion out there right now about what tests are being done, what a positive or a negative test means. Um, in effect, there's two tests that are available for people to consider and uh, that are being used. Um, one is a direct test by uh, doing a sampling of the nasal cavity. And what that test does is look for active virus within you at that time. So that test doesn't tell you whether or not you've been infected in the past. It, it allows one to make a decision if you're carrying an infection you know, at the present time. The second test is the antibody test. And that is, do you have circulating antibodies against this particular virus? That's, that type of test only says that you have been exposed to the virus previously. Um, and it, whether or not you're protected again is, is, is absolutely unknown. The antibody test has been fraught with problems. Um, a lot of false positives, which means people are being tested as positive and never been exposed. And probably even more scary are false negatives. Um, people who are identified to not... Um, you know, to not be susceptible to this thing. And indeed they go then thinking they're protected and they're not. So uh, all this reflects the fact we're dealing with a new virus. We just don't know enough about it yet. And I think once we get a better handle on the characteristics of this virus, um, how many uh, infection cycles it, it can undergo, how quickly it's mutating, we'll have a, a stronger foothold on which to build effective treatments and therapies longer term. I'm going to switch hats here because you wear so many sure. and talk to you now as the chair of the Department of Biology at Northeastern yes. University. Uh, when we last met in your offices at Northeastern, there were students on campus, there were classes, there were lecture halls, everything was operating as it has for hundreds of years in our system. Yes. Yep. And then all of a sudden that changed overnight. And how was it making that uh transition because uh, whatever percentage of online learning was going on at Northeastern obviously changed very quickly and you had to reevaluate everything. Yeah, that's so true. I think I can sum it up in one word and it still is, um, I think, very apropos today and that's surreal. I look back on, you know, the last five, six months um, when we were thinking about this virus as it was entering the U.S. and scattered cases were popping up. Um, and it was still business as usual. Uh, we attended, you know, the International Blues Festival down uh, challenge down in, in Memphis at the end of January. Uh, and the virus is already starting to come into this country. No one was really thinking about this. Um, at the university level, uh, we had already been building out online courses, so to speak, but certainly we have a rich offering of in-person courses taught by instructors. Uh, when this thing uh, really took full force, um, and we realized that the university was best suited to shut down its operations, start scaling back. Um, I, I can characterize it uh, probably as a knee-jerk reaction because of the unknown, uh, the fear of what we were faced with because we didn't understand it, but we were committed to ensuring that the students on our campus who were there to be educated, who were there for deeper learning, uh, indeed were allowed to complete at least that semester to give us some time to retool over the summer and think through where we would stand going into this fall. Um, so we quickly had to retrain faculty and in fact train faculty brand new of how to switch from in-class teaching to uh, online teaching using Zoom, using Teams, um, using active learning strategies that work, really work uh, in a remote way. Um, fortunately, we were able to get through that semester uh, and we learned a lot from it. Um, and we were still at the same time on a social level trying to figure out how to best manage uh, spread of the virus. You know, we've now come up with the 
policies that social distancing does work, uh, keeping your distance from folks, um, respiratory droplets, wearing a mask, um, keeping you know the droplets that we shed every time we speak from spreading around. Uh, and we can maybe talk about masks a little bit later in terms of the correct way to, to wear them and why you'd wanna wear them, the purpose. Um, so hand in hand, I think with rebuilding the curriculum and rebuilding how we're approaching education at a high level, um, where we're learning what best to do socially to try to minimize spread of the disease. Um, as we went into the summer, the virus did not go away, uh, unlike the seasonal flu and seasonal cold. Uh, we've seen resurgence in certain states. That's pretty scary to think about. Um, so we have spent the entire summer um, preparing for the fall semester. Um, how do we achieve some level of normalcy? How do we uh, actively engage our students in uh, deeper knowledge synthesis in learning the way they should um, in the face of dealing with COVID as a backdrop. Um, so Northeasterners come up with a, I think it's just a tremendous strategy. It's an amazing uh, turnaround um, because now it's not a knee jerk reaction, it's a planning reaction. How best do we take what we've learned from the spring and reapply that to fall teaching? Um, so as we go into the fall, Northeastern will open as a canvas, as a campus. Um, there'll be reduced density on the campus and students have the option of being remote and synchronous. That is, they can be uh, anywhere and still be synchronous with the classes. They can be remote and asynchronous. That means they might be in a different time zone and the time of the class just isn't suitable for them. Or there will be in-person options and many students are choosing to come back to campus. The whole campus has been um, essentially rebuilt, plexiglass shields everywhere, uh, unidirectional flow through buildings, minimal density in classrooms, and every classroom has been outfitted with a camera and a microphone to allow real-time recording of every lecture uh, for those students who are not participating you know, um, in present uh, in the classroom. So it's really just a, a phenomenal, phenomenal turnaround. Um, and perhaps even a glimpse of what higher education is going to look like in the future. Uh, I don't think anybody could have predicted that we uh, as a world could function so well electronically, meetings remote, um, teaching remote, grading remote, exams, all this stuff being remote, and it's actually working. Not that we want to bypass the um, importance of having that uh, student instructor relationship of having that personal attention, that guidance that you receive from in class teaching. Um, but we have to do it in a way that's smart, uh, in a way that achieves our goals, in a way that meets our students and their parents' expectations for higher education. Um, but at the same time, we're doing it safely. Uh, we're doing it in a way that will hopefully minimize spread of COVID should it rear its ugly head once again, which I think it probably will. I think that you've uh, along the way, uh, as the universities all over the world are doing, have created yes. a more rich experience for people remotely than ever existed before. Even if there was online learning before, you've improved that dramatically. It probably will give access to people who never would have a chance to come to Northeastern to be a yeah. part of this great university. Yeah, I agree, Jesse, and it's not just Northeastern. All universities are really embracing this idea of how to be creative in the learning approach. Um, we don't want simply to put material up on a website and have students read it and sort of memorize and regurgitate it. That's not learning. Um, learning is really active engagement, um, really a deeper understanding of concepts and building out from those. Um, and, you know, I am absolutely thrilled at the progress we've made in a short time to be able essentially to rewrite how we deliver an education. And you're dead on target with that. I think the ability to deliver high quality content to really engage students, you know, on these remote platforms in a way that they can synthesize knowledge just as well as in person as remote is going to open up opportunities for people to achieve uh, aspirations towards higher education that perhaps they couldn't have done in the past. Um, and the key to this safety, the key to this is being smart. I can't emphasize enough that we have so much, you know, at stake right now, and we all just need to be smart about how to pursue this. Um, mistakes are going to cost us short term and long term. Um, Northeastern actually set up its own internal testing. Um, so everyone on campus, if you're physically on campus, student, staff member, or faculty, uh, you were being tested every five to seven days, every five to seven days. Um, 
there'll be contact tracing. So the university doesn't want to be in a position of waiting until someone shows up with symptoms. They actually want to get out in front of this, detect these things early, and then minimize the spread the correct way. So, you know, we're doing our best. Um, it's still, uh, you know, a murky future because we can't predict anything with this virus. Um, and we're already seeing some universities that have decided to open early. Um, there was just a news report on UNC Chapel Hill. They opened, I think, for about a week, and they uh, identified several clusters of cases, uh, and they had to shut back down and go remote again. Uh, Notre Dame did the same thing. They were open for a couple weeks, and I think they went remote. They're planning on reopening again. And you know, in some of these cases, they're actually tracing the outbreaks back to students partying off campus you know, socializing off campus in ways that are not um, respecting the policies that we need to have in place to keep this thing from spreading. So, you know, this is not a matter of just students being on campus in classrooms. This is how everyone, faculty, staff, and students are really uh, working day in and day out to try to minimize spread in everything that we do uh, in all aspects of our life. It's an incredible rebuild of the university to add the plexiglass and all these other features that you're adding. But where hormones go, reason dare not follow. I can't imagine getting together a bunch of people who are away from home for the very first time in many instances in yes. a uh, socially distanced communal living situation and expect that they will maintain the, the distancing and the one-way protocols that you've set up. Yes. How, do you, how do you deal with that as a university? Yeah, it's, again, it's probably one of the greatest challenges right now. Early on when this virus was taking a hold in this country, there was information spreading that really only people over 60, people with pre-existing conditions were being susceptible to infection with this virus. Um, that's all changed. Young people are, are becoming infected at an alarming rate in this country, uh, in their 20s, in their 30s, in their teens. Um, so no one is immune to this. No one is protected from this. And your point is a good one. We have no control over what students who, perhaps even for the first time in their life, they're you know away from their home, away from their family, away from their household they grew up in. Um, they need to build those social interactions. That's part of higher education. It's not just learning, but developing social skills and communication skills and so forth. Um, so it's a fine line to walk to you know, give them the freedom to make smart choices and, you know, become socially interactive, but at the same time, keep reminding folks that we have to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, crossing lines in terms of numbers of people in small spaces and so forth, not wearing masks appropriately, you know, could potentially trigger another outbreak of this. And it's long term, it's just going to defeat everything that all the planning that's been done uh, to get this in place. You know, I should mention, too, I have two of my own children in high school right now. Um, and I think you probably are aware of this, um, and you've seen this too. Um, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to be a senior in high school or a senior in college for that matter and graduating this past April or May. Um, a, a virtual graduation. It's just incredible. So, you know, we're particularly concerned about our incoming freshman class because they had a very unusual senior year. Um, they're already stressed out about how that impacted their education in completing their final year at high school, um, disrupting their friendships and their social circles then. So it's stressful enough to leave high school and come to college. This year, I think we've added the stress of the disruption of completing high school and then heading into a brand new world of what college is like in the era of COVID. So we're really in tune with trying to ensure that we have faculty presence on campus. We have that you know, active reach out to students. We want them to, to feel at least some degree of normalcy as they approach their education and transition into the university. But at the same time, we constantly have to remind ourselves to be smart. One of the unique resources that you have at Northeastern that the world comes to Northeastern to get is the amazing work at the modeling uh, group yes. you have that uh, predicts the future in many different areas of endeavor Absolutely. and now is focused on COVID. Yes. What learning do we have from your experts at Northeastern on where this is likely to go over the next few months? Yeah, again, they're, they're in top discussions with the university leadership. It's a network science group at Northeastern. It's one of the very few in the country that actually focuses on uh, predictive modeling of mass scale events such as this. 
Um, and, and not just viral pandemics, they're just actually perfectly suited to model this type of pandemic as well. I think the challenge here is there's nothing to base um, decisions on in terms of making best guesses because the virus is brand new. Uh, and we still don't know how it acts. We still don't know its rate of infection. We still don't know its rate of mutation. So it's one of those things where you know, Northeastern has a, a clear edge in this sort of area in terms of its expertise. Um, with this predictive, mod predictive modeling group, they're phenomenal. Um, I mean, it's just, it's one of the best probably in the world, but at the same time, they're somewhat handcuffed in how much information they can reliably look at and make, you know, accurate predictions. So at this stage, the university is in constant discussion with them, trying to get as much information as they can with some degree of, there's no certainty, but, you know, a feeling that they're on the right track with this, but caution is it. Uh, models are models. That's what they are. They allow a prediction to be made. Um, and whether or not the, the model actually bears true or doesn't is always up in the air. Um, and unfortunately, variables such as non-compliance with distancing, um, opening things too soon, um, not wearing masks, not sanitizing, um, those things throw wrenches in predictive models because those are the variables that actually the models can't actually control. Um, so outcomes for these types of models are really dependent upon how we as a population um, look at this virus, um, look at ourselves and say, you know, in the short term, we might be inconvenienced by some of the things that we need to do, but in the long term, we're going to be far better off socially, economically, health-wise, everything. What are the predictions going through the end of the year in terms of how uh, you see the disease progressing based on current trends? Yeah, I, you know, I think we can look at current trends around the world uh, as well as within this country. We can learn a lot from um, states that decided to reopen uh, sooner than other states in terms of businesses and um, having people being able to congregate again and so forth. Um, a few states in this country really had pretty significant resurgence of the virus over the summer. Um, and that's, a, to me, it's a scary harbinger um, that we should be able, we should be looking at these and saying, you know what, in the in the time of year, when the weather is nice and windows are open and there's proper air circulation and people are outdoors, we're still getting these, you know, these resurgences happening around the country in areas that have opened um, and fully opened uh, and people are doing what going about their normal lives. What scares me going into this fall is that the colder weather will come and windows will close again and ventilation will be stale and there won't be proper circulation. So given what I've seen so far with this virus, me personally, I mean, <laughs> I'm hoping for the best, but I think logically we have to think about the worst. And the worst is we're going to relive what we went through this spring, and perhaps it could even be worse. You know, so I can tell you at uh, our level at the university in terms of planning for our students and planning for education, we haven't even really thought about the spring semester yet because it's so far in advance, believe it or not. Normally, we're planning two years out. But with this virus, we really have to take this month by month um, and look at what's happening. And university campuses are somewhat different in many respects because we have students flying in from all over the country. So even if the virus is at bay, so to speak, in that particular region of the country, that infusion of new students from other places could kickstart another round of this. Um, so we're taking it month by month. Uh, we're hoping to get through the, you know, the fall semester, at least through Thanksgiving, um, in an operational fashion with this uh, flexible technology that we have for education. Um, and then it's going to be just called as we see it. Obviously, health uh, and safety are a priority number one. Um, and we know we can deliver now content uh, effectively uh, via these remote platforms. So it's not like we don't have an option should we start to get worried about how this virus is acting going into the fall. Um, we do have backup strategies. We've learned a lot. We've polished you know, the delivery mechanisms for online teaching over the past several months. So. Uh, I truly believe that we're in a far better position going into this fall than we were in the spring when this caught us off guard. Because we know now we have an arsenal of tools that we can use to properly educate our students and keep them engaged um, and simply try to get through this particular year and then hopefully vaccines will roll out and we can look towards next year as a transition year back to, again, some level of normalcy. On a practical level, Sure. We had talked earlier in our conversation about the proper use of masks, and yeah. I wanted you to help us so we as an audience can understand what we should be doing, what's effective, what's not working, 
and, and how can we best protect ourselves in going out? Yeah, I think the mask issue is one that's a perfect example of too much information out there and no one knows what's right or wrong. Um, there have been recommendations made about mask wearing that have been retracted and then others have said masks aren't useful and then they've come about and said they are. Um, so I, I think in the, the most simplest sense to look at, and unless it's a, what's called an N95 or an N99, um, those are specialized surgical masks that protect our sort of frontline folks, the, the doctors, the nurses, the physician assistants, um, who are actively being exposed to patients with the virus. Those masks are actually designed to prevent entry of virus through the mask to the wearer. Um, most of the masks that you see and the recommendations about wearing masks in public, these cloth masks or the, you know, the three-layer surgical masks, the blue ones um, that you can breathe through, um, those masks do not prevent you from getting infected. Um, those masks serve a single purpose, and that's to prevent or minimize the uh, vapor droplets that we release when we speak um, into the surrounding environment. They catch those vapors. They catch that moisture, um, those water droplets that we see. So the best thing that we can do with wearing masks is to make sure your nose and your mouth are properly covered um, because breathing, even you can emit um, vapor particles, which could carry virus if you're asymptomatic and you're infected. Um, so it's really to minimize you spreading potentially something to someone else rather than protecting you from getting the virus if someone else is not wearing a mask and not practicing those precautions. Um, so it's certainly not an effective approach for preventing um, the disease from spreading in terms of minimizing your own possibility of infection, but it's really one in which you are you know, being respectful of others around you um, and doing your best. Even if you feel that you're healthy, you're fine. You just don't know. There's lots of people who have gotten this virus and been infected and totally asymptomatic. They have no symptoms at all, and yet they have the active virus in them. Um, so mask wearing does help, um, you know, at minimum, even just a single cloth mask can help. Um, Multi-layer masks that you can buy now, there's plenty of them available. These are not surgical masks that doctors would wear, but you can buy these for relatively inexpensive Amazon and other places. Um, these things, again, are really designed to help in those settings in which, you know, more than two people are there and they're communicating to try to minimize the spread of the, of the infection that way. I've read that some of the single layer masks people wear actually don't prevent but but merely create micro droplets uh in is that true yeah that's true because the mesh the degree of the mesh or the tightness of the mesh will dictate just how effective the mask is at catching those droplets of moisture that are coming out of your nose or your mouth that's why you know i i, I mentioned that you know even a single layer is better than nothing because it's going to catch at least some um, but certainly um, the multi-layer, the three-ply cloth mask with the layer in the middle, anything you can do to enhance um, the ability to catch those droplets, we're, we're just serving each other better. Um, and this is one of those things. Um, you know, Walter had a song called We're All in This Together. That song is so apropos for this because we are, Jesse, all in this together. You know, this is only going to come to a, you know, some level of conclusion if we all help each other out with this. We all have to understand that, you know, the actions of one can really compromise all the good thinking and planning of others. Um, so we really need to get behind this, embrace this, sanitize your hands, wash your hands, don't touch your face. You know, if you feel ill at all, see your healthcare provider, all this, you know, the logical things um, that we really need to, you know, kind of keep drumming in and drumming in um, at all ages, children all the way up through adults. Um, I found actually children tend to be a little more receptive to this. It's a stubborn old folks like us that tend to not want to listen to those things and start following rules. So um, we really need to beat that drum and just say you can help us all if everyone kind of chips in here. John Tilley, thank you for joining us today from Northeastern University and helping us all understand what's going on with COVID-19, a way that we're going to get back on college campuses and get back to life as it should be, even if it's a little bit different than what we expected. Yeah, well, thank you, Jesse. It's been a pleasure speaking with you as always. Um, and great that you saw Walter in the background. I, you know, For your audience out there, I'm sure they're familiar with Walter and 
Walter's got his new album coming out next week, which is going to be very exciting. I've heard a, a few uh, snippets out of it. It's great stuff, as always. And, um, you know, Walter has uh, made the trek over to Denmark uh, to try to, you know, um, ride out this pandemic in a, a safer environment, and I'm thrilled for that. Um, so um, it, it's just... Again, I, I think when I when I look at this from every perspective, I have a love of the blues. I have a love of my own research. I have a love of educating young people and creating the next wave of of scientists and medical providers and and people work in industry. Um, it, you know, this affects us all. Um, it, it really does, and we all need to do our part to try to help everyone get through this. Um, we're all, you know, being disadvantaged or compromised in one way or another. Um, some worse than others. Some have their livelihood dependent upon social interactions like blues artists. Um, so, you know, we will get through this. I'm confident of that. We need to stay upbeat, um, but we need to make sure that we're respectful of all of us and, and do our part. So pleasure talking with you as always. Well, thank you, and we'll catch up soon. Absolutely, Jesse.